that reminder one more time. So, hi, welcome. Um, I'm Seal Rosignal, the Education and Programming Coordinator for CB, and really excited to facilitate this Pichacucha night tonight with all of you. We've got some really great presenters um, from our community and beyond. Um, and so, and we've all decided that this is hard to do, <laughs> to, to organize and uh, make your own Pecha Kucha. So, um, uh, but it's a good thing we are, we are, um, it, it's gonna be fine. <laughs> um, I wanted to introduce a couple people to you just straight off the, um, straight off the bat in terms of tech support. So Michael Dunn, he can wave. You'll see him, it says CB Tech Support. And Renee Igo, who is our communications and project um, coordinator. So they're on tech support. So if you're having issues with anything in particular, then you could email them, I email, message them directly in, in the chat. But um, they are on top of it today for sure. Um, and be impossible to do this without them. Um, so welcome again officially to CB's Pecha Kucha Night as part of CB's 2030 um, Climate Conversions, 2030 Vision from Climate Action to Climate Justice. Um, and we've got events, uh, it, some of you might have been able to make it last night um, to our keynote speaker um, on your right who did a fantastic job but is also here again tonight um, partnering, um, doing a, um, a Pecha Kucha. And um, we've got other events during the course of the week. But um, we also, before we start getting into that, we want to give a big shout out to our sponsors, um, our movement builder and change maker sponsors, including um, Wheeler Insurance, uh, Pleasant Hill Property Services, Garbocane Integrated Solar Builders, West Coast Maine, um, and Maine Passive House. Uh, those in particular, those in particular, uh, sponsors are right in our neighborhood here in the Western foothills and um, doing good work here in all kinds of realms um, and really giving back to the community. So we appreciate that. And then also Sierra Club Maine, um, Natural Resources Council of Maine and Revision Energy and Power Market who um, have more statewide uh, reach and have been wonderful at supporting us for multiple events over the years. And so we just wanna make sure to give them all big shout outs. Um, and if you, are, if you are anywhere in the vicinity and ever have the opportunity to patronize any of these businesses, please do so and mention that you appreciate their sponsorship of CB. Um, so thank you to our sponsors. Um, we also wanna to start tonight and every night uh, with a land acknowledgement. In the, in the past year, a large portion of, of my work has been in supporting educators and taking the learning outside. An important piece of this has been to build awareness around Maine's native peoples and their ties to and stewardship of the land past and present. So I'd like to take a moment to do that here with all of you. We acknowledge that the land upon which we play, work, teach and learn has been stolen from the Wabanaki people, the people of the dawn. We celebrate the collective wisdom of the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, Penobscot, and Passamaquoddy tribes and work to take accountability and make repair for the many past and present injustices that, that have resulted from colonization. We are humbled, appreciative, and proud to learn from and collaborate with Native Maine leaders as we, work, as we work toward climate justice together. Whenever I take a group outside, I pause for a moment with them and make this an acknowledgement. Um, and I just think it's especially poignant um, right now for, for many reasons. Um, so thanks for, for taking that time with me. Um, I wanted to also um, talk to you about uh, the lineup for the events of the week. Um, tonight, as you know, is Pecha Kucha night. Um, tomorrow night, uh, Forging the Path, the Youth Leadership Panel is gonna be facilitated by CB Zone Jessica Cooper. Um, she's gonna have some amazing uh, main youth activists. And um, that was, was like big, we, we did a piece, um, we did a youth panel at our 2020 event last year. And it, it was uh, a, a lot of people in terms of feedback noted that as the highlight. So I'm really excited for tomorrow night. So try not to miss that. Um, Wednesday, um, answer, answer the call, get your green on for St. Patty's Day, come learn about our working group. So we're gonna have different breakout rooms with our six working groups. So it's an opportunity to come and talk to people um, in terms of if there's a working group that you might be interested in and uh, hopefully we can you know, get you into the fold. 
to make some good things happen. Um, Thursday is going to be a legislative update and social hour. And there's information on all of these things on the website. Renee is going to put a link into the chat um, with, that has just more details about these evenings. So I hope you can join us. Um, we should have given a prize for who can come to everything <laughs> all week long. Um, so that's the lineup for the week. And in terms of the lineup for this evening, um, we have a lot of wonderful topics that people are going to cover. Um, and from reimagining waste to get your carbon cash back to how to declare a climate emergency 101 for people who that's new for, uh, fostering sense of place, what's possible when we step into the light. Um, we're gonna talk about the value of belonging and also our power, consumer owned utilities. We're gonna talk about food. Can't talk about climate justice without talking about food. Feeding the foothills, community food matters and foothills food works. Um, their co-coordinators are going to be talking to you. And then also CB Community Solar toward an equity-based cooperative model. So that's the gamut of topics. So I hope there are things there that have got you fired up because that's the goal of this evening. The, the Pecha Kucha format is um, a presentation format for storytelling, 20 slides with 20 seconds per slide. Um, and like I said, it was definitely challenging um, to create them. And so um, big shout out to all our presenters for, for taking on that challenge. And then after all of the presentations are done, we're going to be dividing up um, randomly into breakout rooms for some, well, and we'll see, we'll see in terms of our numbers, but probably doing that for 10 or 15 minutes for some small group discussion um, about what resonated with you, what sparked your interest. Um, okay. Uh, so thanks for putting the website in the chat, Renee. So if anybody wants to find out more about the other, the rest of the week's events, you can look there. In terms of Zoom nuts and bolts, um, which we always have to go over, uh, please mute yourself during the presentations. And uh, if you don't want to be recorded, turn off your, your video. Or if you're going to be up moving around, chopping vegetables, making dinner, I don't know, working on a puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> Please cut your video, um, just so it's not distracting to the speakers. Um, and if you want to change the view, if, if you're not familiar with how to use Zoom, in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, you'll see the view. And so we recommend the side-by-side -side speaker view if you want to be able to see the slides really well. And like I said, if there's any tech issues that you're having or having a difficulty, please reach out to Renee or Mike in the chat. All right. Perfect. So I'm going to introduce, I almost said any questions, but because <laughs> I'm so used to doing that with groups, I'm going to um, introduce our first Pecha Kucha. So um, Justin Bondison and Jess Cooper are worker owners of the Spoke Folks Cooperative. They live and work in Norway. Jess is a youth climate action coordinator with CB, a founding board member of Creative Norway, and staff at Fair Share Food Co-op. Justin is a gardener, hiker, biker, and educator who is passionate about compost. They share the values of waste reduction, connecting with community, and lessening ecological impact, which led them to co-found Spoke Hoax with Scott Glahn and Lou Brown. So take it away, Jess and Justin. All right. Woohoo! All right. Thanks, Seal. Well, I'm Jess Cooper. I'm Justin Bonnison. And we, we are, are Spoke, Spoke Folks. Folks. Yeah. <laughs> we are a bike powered hauling cooperative specializing in trash, recycling, and compost. And we are reimagining waste. So, thank you for joining us this evening. Yeah, silence. <laughs> <laughs> the golden silence. Uh, we did the, my first Pecha Kucha was doing this a year ago. So yeah. So, as we said, we're celebrate. two out of four of the worker owners. There's also Scott and Lou who are both on this call. So, hey guys. Um, we all own this business together and that's what being a worker owned cooperative means. Um, here's a great picture of us in front of our awesome trailer and yeah. So what do we do? Uh, quite simply is we haul uh, garbage, recycling and compost and anything else on uh, bikes. So we have a 12 foot trailer made by a company called Bikes at Work out in Iowa. And since October, we have been picking up trash. Um, our mission really breaks down into two parts. We wanna lessen the environmental impact of trash that's already happening. 
mostly by using bikes as an alternative to trucks and cars. And we also want to divert food waste uh, from landfills. Uh, we're trying to incentivize people to recycle. And we're also trying to create equitable, healthy work in our community. So the equitable part comes in with cooperatives, which Jess will talk about later, and healthy because we're using our body to do work. And we're going to do this by providing an, a valuable and necessary service in our town. So uh, people always ask us, why bikes? But really, the question is, why not bikes? So pictured here is the normal, right? Uh, big old garbage truck. They're very inefficient. They're stopping and starting, idling all the time. The average diesel garbage truck gets three to four miles per gallon. So I don't probably need to work too hard to convince anyone here that waste production in America is a big problem. The average American generates four and a half pounds of trash per day. Uh, this is a breakdown as of 2017 of what that material solid waste was made up of. Um, so this is a problem for many reasons. There's the emissions involved in transporting it, hauling it to and from transfer stations and to and from landfills. And then the problem that this stuff doesn't just go away. It ends up in our oceans, um, heavy metals and other toxins end up in our soils. Some of these materials can be reclaimed and reused, but there's some problems associated with that. I mean, I can't even get into plastics here. Um, so the question is, is where does your trash go when, if it doesn't just go away? Here's our transfer station. We don't have a lot of garbage trucks in our town, but folks are bringing their own stuff to the transfer station. So we want to we wanna do address the nearly uh, 10,000 residents bringing in their daily four and a half pounds. Right. And so where did this idea come from? Um, well, it turns out there's a really successful biker uh, bike hauling cooperative called Pedal People in Northampton, Mass. And Scott got a chance to ride with them as an idea for starting a cooperative and then knew that Norway is a really flat area and brought it back here and we all started working on it. So we started riding in earnest in October and this is our low ball estimation uh, that we've saved about 55 trips to the transfer station and assuming that would all be cars. That means we've diverted 147 pounds of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere which is the area of 300 by 300 by 300 feet, which is like a football field. So that's awesome. And we're just getting started. Um, and then the other thing we're really excited about is composting. So that's just the emission of transport. Uh, when food waste and, and organic material ends up in landfills, it breaks down anaerobically and creates greenhouse gases. So uh, we're planning to partner with the Allen Day Community Garden this summer and to create our own compost out of our neighbors' um, food scraps and waste. And we're planning to give it back to the garden and to our community to build the soil instead of uh, letting that stuff create more greenhouse gases. Yes, it does, really. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't only haul trash recycling and compost, we also do general hauling. You can see in these pictures, Scott is hauling some lumber and with the Solidarity Projects, Gar the Solidarity Garden Project last year, we were hauling planters to different people around town, lots of soil. So there's a lot of things we can do with these bikes, not just that. Um, you can see how dense Norway is uh, on the downtown strip. Um, we're about a mile from our transfer station, which it's all pretty flat, which makes it super easy for us to do what we're doing. Um, a lot of times people ask like, what are you gonna do about hills? There are some big hills in our area, but we're looking at electric assists in the future. So um, this is a great picture we took last week of Wu uh, downtown. This is our main street, all the beautiful buildings. He's kind of stopping some trucks and traffic. And I think it just shows how, how great it looks to see a bike out there. Um, we service these trash stations for the town of Norway on our main street. Um, and so yeah, Spoke Folks is a worker-owned cooperative. We operate on the seven cooperative principles. And this is the equitable part of our mission that we um, are working towards. Some of the cooperative principles that we feel are reflected in what we do are concern for our community. Um, there's a couple others, but <laughs> the Cooperative Development Institute is uh, a nonprofit in New England that has supported us immensely. Um, so spoke folks would not have been possible without their support and the support of CB. Um, they are working to create a cooperative economy in New England, and it's been really amazing. So how can you support us? If you're in our area, first and foremost, signing up for our services is the best way that you can support us. 
If you're not in our area, we do have a GoFundMe dedicated to building up what we're doing and being able to fund future projects like expanding to other areas in Maine. So um, follow us. We have awesome, we have an awesome website. We have an awesome Facebook and Instagram. <laughs> and like what we're doing, share what we're doing, sign up if you're able to. And if you're not, just keep keep looking out for what we're doing because there's lots of cool stuff. Thanks for listening. And we'll put some links in the chat for you guys. Yeah. Terrific. Thanks so much, Jess and Justin. I love see when I'm seeing them zoom around Norway. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> love the winter pictures, especially. So awesome. Thanks so much. Great job. Our next speaker is Cynthia Stanchoff. Um, she advocates, advocates for the planet from her home in Chesterville and is active with the CB Climate Action Team, the Franklin County Climate Crisis Coalition, and the mid main chapter of the Citizens Climate Lobby. The rest of the time, she looks for mushrooms. Welcome to me. Thanks. Hey everyone, I'm here to tell you about an initiative in Maine aimed at engaging local citizens in a national climate policy through passing resolutions in their town meetings and town councils. This all volunteer effort is the Carbon Cash Back for Maine campaign. And it builds on the work of the Citizens Climate Lobby, which is a national nonpartisan group of volunteers focused on building political will with grassroots to grass tops lobbying for cash back carbon pricing as outlined in the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, a, bill they, a bipartisan bill they helped create and will soon be reintroduced. So why do we think a national policy should be a local issue? Well, because a national and in fact global problem is having increasingly obvious local effects. Hey, lobsters are leaving, waters are warming, blueberries are baking, ski season is shortening, pests are proliferating, need I go on? Global warming slash climate change is of course caused by the once beneficial greenhouse effect on steroids. Modern greenhouse gas emissions, mostly CO2 have increased the heat trapping layer of the atmosphere so much the planet in effect has a fever and the fever is rising. Climate modeling shows that to keep warming, no, the connection between human industrial activity and modern levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide is pretty darn clear. As you can see in this graph of the past 800,000 years, CO2 has spiked periodically, but never has it resembled the spike of the last 100 years or the level it's at now. Climate modeling shows that to keep warming to one and a half degrees Celsius, which is considered by most to be the limit for a future habitable planet, we've got to reduce emissions drastically and swiftly because our current trajectory lands us at 3.6 degrees of warming by the end of the century. No one policy can solve the climate problem, but top economists and climate policy experts agree that correcting the prices of fossil fuels is one of the most effective ways to swiftly reduce carbon emissions. In essence, if fossil fuels are priced to reflect their hidden costs, they'll lose ground to cleaner fuels and will use less of them. So all carbon pricing attaches a fee to fossil fuels as they enter the economy based on their anticipated carbon emissions. Cash back carbon pricing, carbon fee and dividend, returns all the fees to all American residents with equal per person monthly checks for all, all adults and half shares for children. The idea for carbon pricing came from some pretty conservative economists who identified the source of our carbon pollution problem as a market failure that is due to various subsidies and fossil fuel prices. The fossil fuel prices have been too low and because they haven't included their hidden costs. So this pollution fee will start at $15 a ton of carbon and would be increased by $10 per year and this increased cost to producers would no doubt be passed on to buyers of the fuel and then on to goods manufactured with it. But does that mean all prices will rise just as much? No, because increasing fossil fuel costs will incentivize energy efficiency improvements and use of renewables by industry and business. And meanwhile, build a new energy economy. All the same, and at the same time, the dividend will enable consumers to choose among products and priorities in their household budgets. 
In the cashback carbon pricing we support, all the fees would be deposited in a carbon trust fund and completely dispersed monthly. Every individual would get the same amount. An already existing agency like the Treasury would handle the money for minimal administrative fees, and that makes it a revenue neutral policy that doesn't grow the government. You can see here that in Maine, most households would come out ahead with a monthly dividend. In general, lower income households benefit more because they, they consume less but get the same dividend. So in all areas, between 50% and 70% of households will come out ahead. Only the wealthiest would lose a few percent. It's estimated that in the first 10 years of this, over 2 million new jobs will be created, 400,000 pollution-related deaths prevented, and a 95% reduction in mercury emissions. The year 10 annual dividend for a family of four is projected to be $4,410. And most of all, most importantly, this policy itself could cut U.S. carbon emissions by 40% in 12 years, 90% by 2050, enough to meet the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's emission targets for limiting warming to below two degrees Celsius. So what about other countries? Well, 46 other countries already employ carbon pricing and many more are discussing it. Our closest trading partner, Canada, has it. The EU is considering going international with it and penalizing trading partners lacking a carbon pricing system. So it behooves us to get on board. The carbon cashback from Maine campaign recruits town champions to get articles on their annual town meeting warrants asking voters to one, endorse a national carbon fee and dividend policy, and two, encourage Congress and the president to enact it. Win or lose, this gets a hopefully respectful climate conversation going in our communities. The municipalities with a town or city council and no annual town meeting, town champions can re request a resolution of the council endorsing the policy. They can also ask for endorsements by businesses, nonprofits, whoever, because it's all about building understanding of and political will for this awesome climate solution. So all warrant articles and council resolutions contain a requirement that the town shall inform the state legislators, the governor, the members of Congress, and US president about the town's action. In this way, carbon cash back for Maine can amplify the voices of individuals so they echo down through the halls of power. Yeah, so join us. Um, help us build the political will in our communities to enact a policy that's big enough, equitable enough, and effective enough to do enough toward improving everyone's prospects for a future livable world. You can find out more at carboncashbackforme.org. Thank you. Awesome, Cynthia. That was really exciting. Thank you so much for that. Gosh, I've got so many questions and we've only done two so far. <laughs> That's great. Uh, next up, we're gonna learn about declaring a climate emergency. It's kind of a 101 for those of us who have it, who this is new to. Um, so we're gonna welcome Sarohi Kumar, who's a 16 year old climate activist, activist from Bar Harbor, Maine. She helped declare a climate emergency in Bar Harbor and has since been working to spread that momentum across the state. We also have Anya Wright, a co-founder of Maine Youth for Climate Justice, the youth representative on the Maine Climate Council and now a grassroots organizer with Sierra Club Maine. So welcome and go to it. All right, hi everybody. Um, as Seal said, I'm Sarohi, that's Anya. We don't have a fun dynamic intro like Jess and Justin, but let's get into it. We're here to teach you guys about climate emergency declarations. So a climate emergency declaration is a piece of legislation passed by a municipality that acknowledges that the climate crisis is an emergency and usually commits the town to some form of action to counteract it. Um, a climate emergency Climate emergency declarations are part of a statewide and international and international movement. Over 130 governments in the US have declared a climate emergency and many more internationally. Um, over the course of this Pecha Kucha, we're gonna take you, take you through the steps required to declare a climate emergency, as well as what we, the process we followed when we declared a climate emergency in Bar Harbor. Um, this is divided into like <laughs> three or four parts. And I'm incredibly nervous, so let's do this. 
Yeah, so in Bar Harbor, we declared a climate emergency in November of 2019. Um, and as we go through these steps, we'll tell you a bit about our, our experiences. So step one is uh, all about building a team um, and building your momentum. So if you're interested in passing a climate emergency declaration, we encourage you to reach out to groups like Maine Youth Strikes or Maine Youth for Climate Justice. Um, we'll put some links in the chat at the end. Um, and we also encourage you to take some time to understand your community, um, do some town mapping, some community mapping, and take some time to understand your government structure. Um, some questions that we'd like to have people ask are, who holds power in your, uh, in your town? Um, and how much power does your local government have in the community? So in Bar Harbor, high school students collaborated with college students in a student-led uh, initiative where adult allies came out in support, but the initiative was really, really um, led by youth, um, which is exciting. That's right. <laughs> uh, there are many resources available for the actual language of the legislation. That's not really the most important part. Uh, the most important bits are the action steps that come after the declaration of an emergency. This is where your knowledge of the power that your government holds in your community, as well as the social environment of your community really comes in handy. If you're gonna make your climate emergency declaration action-based, you have to know um, what your town is willing to pass. So in Bar Harbor, we had an adult ally in the town council who told us it would be plausible for us to ask for a portion of the budget. Other places might not have that kind of leniency because of the people on their local government. Um, if you want to make your declaration more of a symbolic thing, you can step away from action steps and focus more on local education. That's also okay. The whole point is just to build momentum through your community. Um, and a bit more on passing and what it takes to pass a climate emergency declaration, declaration and build momentum. Um, we're in a difficult time right now during COVID times where we can't hold in-person events and a lot of organizing has to be done over social media. But uh, when we can organize in person again, um, some tactics that we used were to find community centers and put information there. Um, we also attended a climate strike and spoke there to encourage folks to attend the town council meeting. Uh, we got a petition for folks to sign, which is also a virtual option. Um, we also worked with existing social change organizations in Bar Harbor and collaborated on this project. So we worked with a Climate to Thrive, Indivisible, um, and a College of the Atlantic group. Um, so when it comes to the actual event where it's being voted on, um, we encourage folks to get testimony from people in the community who have influence. So teachers, pastors, firefighters, business owner, owners, parents, um, and others. We brought in high school students who had passed a plastic bag ban to speak. Um, and we also had conversations with municipal leaders ahead of time town councilors, town managers, um, and other town leaders um, so that we made sure that they understood where, um, where our action and motivation was coming from um, and why people cared about the declaration and wanted it to pass. Um, and this really helped us in the long run in terms of uh, getting the declaration passed. The next step is your follow-up action. Um, your follow-up action can be the action steps that are included in your actual declaration or just stuff you're doing afterwards. So in the town of Bar Harbor, our declaration actually passed only in part. The action step of the formation of a task force was denied by our town council. So we went back to them with a request to form a task force. That was the form of our uh, follow-up action. And I'm currently the youth representative on that task force. Other action can be the modification of an already existing government structure, like a sustainability committee, giving it new and time sensitive goals, as well as providing them more resources. Or again, they could be focused on the public education of your community to focus more on just bringing awareness to this issue. Or you could take the momentum and the allies you gained in your town and move to another town and try to declare a climate emergency there. Yeah, um, and so back back to the part about COVID and declaring a climate emergency. Um, some advice that we have for folks is to try and minimize events online that are meant to spread information. Um, we're all suffering from Zoom fatigue. Um, we're, we've all spent too much time online. So um, 
They like to tell folks to use social media to send out information bursts um, or, you know, using um, email listservs, other ways to get folks information that doesn't involve them sitting on Zoom for an hour. Um, and when possible, it's also important to try to use in-person connections to convince people to, to help you. Um, so on our final slide, we have um, our information and some links, which I'll also put in the chat. Um, please check them out and feel free to reach out to Sarohi or I for more information. And good luck passing your climate emergency declaration. Terrific. Thank you so much, Sarohi and Anya. That was great to hear that story of how that actually happens. So thank you. Um, Mike, it's asking me to unmute myself, but I think I'm unmuted. So I'm not sure why that You're came good. Up. You're unmuted. Yeah, sound good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Should I hit later? I'm just trying to, it's like on my screen. I'm just going to say later. I'm not sure why it said that to me, but anyway, thank you so much for that. Next up, we have me. <laughs> so introducing myself again, Seal Rosignol. Um, my, my presentation is called Into the Light, um, Fostering Sense of Place. You'll see that slide in a second. Um, I'm the Programming and Education co Coordinator um, and also co-founder of CB and uh, just love spending my days outside. So this is a story of light, moving into the light, feeling on your face, looking for the light at the end of the tunnel, being inspired by the light in others and inviting others into the light. The title means more than just stepping outside. It means shining a light on what has been left in darkness. There is a slide there. Here we go. Eric Fromm, social behaviorist and philosopher, said that biophilia was the passionate love of life in all that is alive. And sociobiologist E.O. Wilson defined it as the urge to affiliate with other forms of life. In our quest for climate justice, this concept begs the question, so who gets access to place, especially outdoor place and space? The change makers who are in the thick of it right now are all people who are somehow, somewhere um, rooted in place. They know, they understand, they care about and advocate for their place. Equity, access, voice and choice and participatory and decision-making experiences are key. So there are many ways to make this happen. One is through education. It's the slow road that is vital to the climate action and climate justice movement. Integral to the sea change in education is fostering a sense of place. If we nurture, if we can nurture connection to community, natural and human built, and also teach the habits of systems thinking, we may not find history repeating itself again and again. We know that getting outside is good for us and has been encouraged more than ever before um, due to the pandemic. So part of equity in fostering sense of place is looking at options. What options do we have to get outside? What's our access? What cultural values affect us being outside? What experiences or traumas have we had that are already framing that experience before we even step out the door? And how does it begin? How do you foster and cultivate it? And you can't care about a place until you know it, understand it and love it. Then you can act on its behalf. And our society has always needed all voices and all perspectives at the table. Public school education programs are an excellent place to start. So what do we do? We create a gathering place we can enter all year long. A place for everyone where they have the time and access to develop their own individual experiences. Children already know that they are innately connected to the natural world. They don't see or feel separation until they are older. So our job is to catch that innate knowing, help them experience wonder, awe, and curiosity. And that picture was from this school, Agnes Gray Elementary School, um, a small school in West Paris, Maine, that has a population or has a student body of 134 students and over 60% are on free and reduced lunch. The students there have a lot of needs that need to be met. And there's a budding outdoor learning program there to help them create that connection to place. And how do, and how do we do it once we get moving? We explore, we allow children to explore. Uh, foster in them a sense of awe so that they can share what they notice and what they wonder. What do you see? What do you feel? What do you hear? Give students an opportunity to delve into the vi vibrancy that each season offers. Experimenting. 
trying your hand at grinding corn on rocks as the Native Americans did, creating a nature made meal on a maple leaf plate, connecting tasks from our daily lives to the outdoors through experimentation. They also need to spend time quietly and in solitude, time to listen. These are sit spots that the, ch the children had in the outdoor learning space at Agnes Gray. One child, one place, same place all year long. Time to draw, write, notice the changes to their own special place throughout the seasons. They need to feel in touch using natural materials to create art, building boats out of leaves and birch bark and seeing if that's gonna float in the nearby stream practicing fine motor skills, all with nature in mind. Knowing and understanding, sorting patterns that can be found in nature, learning about meanders, symmetry, spiral and waves, looking for evidence of these patterns in frozen, in frozen books and walking around in the nearby forest, building three-dimensional maps out of um, of your outdoor place using natural objects and learning about the living systems of other forest dwellers from which we are not so different. Sharing and collaborating, boiling water to share hot drinks, gathering and compiling the harvest and finding evidence of others who share the space and also have a right to be there. It all builds awareness and connection. Also celebrating the return of the light with the help of many little hands and many little feet, we created the spiral, we walked it um, we shared intentions, we built the fire, and we welcomed the light back. Education is an art. It's simultaneously, we've, we, simultaneously weaving a million different concepts into everyday learning. As children develop, reconnect, rediscover their sense of self in relation to the natural world, we also need to be illustrating for them the interdependence that exists in our natural and human built communities. Without a systems thinking approach, there will be no climate justice. When we choose to practice using the tools on the right in each graphic, we choose to widen our view, gather in alternate perspectives, pull others in and unite for a common goal or purpose. All of these tools or concepts are evident in the outdoors. And when we explicitly use this language with all children, we allow their minds space to be open, willing and wonderful. All of these tools are evident in these habits. If we can purposely follow, foster these habits in all students through connecting them with their communities, just imagine the resiliency we can foster. How many of these do you practice regularly? What if they were taught explicitly? These habits paired with a strong sense of place, what a gift to give to our children. And it brings us full circle again. We come back to equity. Who gets the access? Whose place is it? Who gets the opportunity to cultivate this piece of themselves? Who gets to learn and practice the habits of a systems thinker? We know the hopeful response to these questions, but we need to ensure it moving forward. It is every person's birthright to know and connect with place, beginning with their own natural place, be that city park, plant in the window, jungle, plains, or tundra. Implicit in the present and future of climate justice must be the chance for each and every child to step into that light, to explore and experiment, sit quietly and listen, feel in touch, know and understand, share and collaborate, and celebrate their connection to place. <laughs> Great, thank you. Nice work, Seal. <laughs> Thanks, only practiced a thousand times. <laughs> All right, next up, we've got Erica Lindstrom. She is the board president for the Allen Day Community Garden, and she's gonna talk to us about belonging. Thanks, Seal. Community gardens embody a direct response to the call for climate justice. In addition to the clear need to move beyond a fossil-fueled food system, the community connections they offer are equally valuable. At Allen Day Community Garden in Norway, Maine, we are taking local action to affect global change. And I'd like to start us off by sharing my story with you, which I have entitled One Mile and a Hot Pot of Soup. On September 10th, 2017, I was invited to the Community Garden's annual harvest party. I walked from my home in Norway with a heavy hot pot of soup because that seemed like the choice someone going to the community garden would make. Before I had stepped foot in the garden, I was already thinking differently about my actions, all because of that single invitation. 
While I would like to say that my passion for food justice and climate justice was always there, the belonging came first. The value and connection I felt from being part of this community helped me to take action. I was not a gardener and had a superficial understanding of terms like food access and food justice. I have so much room to grow still, but my own experiences have helped me understand how belonging might be the first step for many people to take action. The garden has a similar story, which started with a community invitation. Alan Day's family wanted to honor him and heal from his loss by investing back into the community. They invited the community to envision the best use of the land with growing concern about the effects of climate change, loss of community gathering space and a failing community food system. The plan for a community garden was seeded. Hundreds of people participated in co-creating the mission, breaking ground to make garden beds, growing food and building community. The community garden gives us the opportunity to reduce our carbon footprint, improve the land and come together to learn about and support a regenerative food system. In social environments where people feel valued and cared about, they are more likely to engage in positive activity for themselves as well as their community and environment. For over a decade, the community garden has been working to decrease the root causes of poor health such as isolation, disconnection, and not feeling valued. Members of socially connected communities are more likely to thrive. Research shows that individuals who feel a sense of security, belonging, and trust in their community have better health and are more likely to promote well being for all. Working together to promote health for all is the approach we need to address climate change. Addressing root causes of hunger and poverty is imperative in our approach toward climate justice. We focus on empowerment and community resilience, moving the conversation beyond charity models that tend to perpetuate systemic inequities. We take a youth-centered approach by training future food system leaders and environmental advocates, creating safe spaces for youth to have challenging conversations, and offering skills and resources that empower direct, collaborative action. Capitalism, on the other hand, encourages individualism, isolation, and non-cooperation because more individual consumers means more profit. Despite claiming an e equal opportunity for all, capitalism increases socioeconomic inequities. Community gardens have the opposite effect, providing shared land access, tools, and resources and most importantly, connecting people. Community garden plots provide one solution to the obstacle of equitable land access, which is also tied to systemic racism in the US food system. Community plots help level the field and promote common ground for accessing local food. Our community farmers market offers a welcoming space where a diverse group of community members can make personal connections in ways that our digital hangouts simply cannot replicate. Tangible relationships to people, environment, and food are crucial to sustain a healthy community and environment. The foundations of our youth leadership program are land stewardship, regenerative growing practices, and building community resilience. A safe and inclusive environment is essential for personal growth, gaining confidence, and learning how to take real leadership for the future of our planet. Our Solidarity Gardens program builds home gardens around the community, removing barriers such as transportation and access to tools. Climate justice means working together to find solutions that work for everyone while protecting the environment. We host a variety of cooking programs for all ages to promote lifelong skills and long-term positive health outcomes. Developing cooking skills helps to lower barriers to local food access. Eating local is not just a nutritional benefit, it's good for our economy and our transition toward fossil fuel independence. At the community garden, we continue to develop climate friendly models. We have plans to expand our solar array and build a year round solar powered kitchen classroom greenhouse. Season extension and food preservation are two major ways to increase local food access throughout the year and to decrease the giant carbon footprint of global food transportation. 
The original founders of the garden envisioned a time when the organization could be an umbrella for many community gardens throughout towns in the area. Allen Day Community Garden serves as an educational demonstration garden. And for those who are looking to start a garden, please let us know, we can help. When the work feels hard, I remind myself that one small connection to the community can lead to action. For me, it only took a single invitation to fire up my passion for community gardens and to feel empowered to step into leadership roles, both with the garden and within my community. From growing community resilience to growing our local food system, community gardens are a sign of revitalization, empowerment, and resistance to a global food system that accelerates climate change and inequity. I invite you to join us at the Allen Day Community Garden where everyone has something valuable to contribute. Thank you. I love that. Thank you so much, Erica. I love hearing your personal story because I didn't know how you had gotten involved in the garden. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Nicole Gr Grahoski. Am I saying that right, Nicole? Okay, great. Um, she is serving her second term as the state representative for Ellsworth and Trenton. As a member of the legislature's Energy, Utilities, and Technology Committee, she champions policies that promote an affordable and equitable transition to a clean energy economy for Maine. I don't think we can hear you, Nicole. Can I get a redo? <laughs> well, we'll see how, how good Mike done. Are you able to back it up, Mike? Great. My apologies. My system must have been looking for a different microphone. Oh, yeah, because you didn't show up as muted, so. Nope, I was not. All right. OK, he's pushing play now. Go back, go back. Thank you. Sorry, everyone. Are we going? I think so. Did you need to go back one more slide? Nope. I'm sorry. I just didn't hear the, the go. Anyhow. We, we will start. take it. We will take it from the top. Hold on one second here. <laughs> sorry, everyone. It was oh, bound to happen. Here we go. Keep it That's your, okay. Okay. Yeah. That's your first slide. Here we go. So Kodiak, Alaska, Rockport, Missouri, Georgetown, Texas, Aspen, Colorado, Greensburg, Kansas, and Burlington, Vermont. Ranging in size, location, and political leaning, you might be surprised to learn what these cities have in common. They are the first six jurisdictions in the U.S. to achieve 100% renewable energy. They are also all served by consumer-owned utilities. Tonight, I'll explain what a consumer-owned utility is and how it is the key to reaching our goal to make Maine the first state to reach net zero carbon affordably and equitably. We must take bold action and we must take it now. Electricity is key to climate action. We must generate electricity from renewable resources and distribute it via the grid of poles and wires to power our homes, heating and cooling, vehicles, and even industry. It must be affordable and reliable so that all can benefit. There are two utility models, investor-owned and consumer-owned. Both focus on benefiting their owners, and that is where the difference lies. In the first case, the owners are distant investors aiming to maximize profit. In the other case, the owners and the consumers are one and the same, as are their goals. These two utility models are common in America. In fact, one in three Americans get their electricity from consumer-owned utilities. In Maine, we have nine consumer-owned utilities. The largest is Eastern Maine Electric Cooperative, which serves a rural area in Down East Maine, 2.5 times the size of Rhode Island. The problem with investor-owned utilities like CMP and Versant is that they are committed to profit, not Mainers. This is how we end up with poor service, billing fiascos, and no leadership when it comes to climate. We also have the worst reliability in the nation as shown here, which means more frequent and longer outages. Electric utilities have no natural competition. As regulated monopolies, they are guaranteed a profit between 8 to 14% by Supreme Court rulings. This high rate of return on investment drives electricity rates up 
and means that most Maine residents pay 58% more on their bills than they would if they were served by a Maine consumer owned utility. Compared to their foreign owned and controlled utility counterparts, consumer owned utilities are local in every sense of the word. These nonprofit utilities focus investments in their infrastructure, customer service, and personnel. Their decisions are made at public meetings by people who live in the communities they serve. Consumer and utilities can access capital to build infrastructure at one third to one half the private sector rate through tax exempt revenue bonds backed by people who pay their electricity bills. Low cost capital frees up money to reduce rates, invest in the grid and ensure that crews are properly staffed. Nationally, these customers pay 13% less than those of investor owned utilities. Now that you understand the basics of how these two models perform, respond to customer needs and our finance, what if I told you that we'll need substantial investment in our grid infrastructure to provide three times more electric power in Maine to address climate change? Which model would you choose? If you chose the consumer and utility model, you are correct. The switch will save Maine $9 billion over 30 years and savings start right away. It's the same idea as refinancing your house at a lower interest rate. When combined with consumer owned generation, Maine can transition to a clean electricity economy without paying more for energy than we do today. So to achieve this affordable clean energy vision, a broad coalition of Maine ratepayers, business leaders, energy experts, and conservationists has joined forces under the name Our Power. We understand what's at stake for the climate and Mainers wallets. We understand that transitioning to clean energy can be a game changer for Maine if it's done right. Our Power seeks to purchase CMP and Burson at a fair price and replace it with a locally controlled nonprofit utility. It will be financed by low interest revenue bonds, not taxes, state bonds, or state funds. This is the same way the Turnpike Authority is, is financed. It would continue to pay municipal property taxes and be governed by an elected board. The resulting company, Pine Tree Power, would own the grid infrastructure that connects energy supply to our homes, businesses, and industries. We need reliable and affordable electricity in order for our clean energy transition to succeed. We cannot convince people to switch to heat pumps and EVs if their power is expensive and goes out regularly. Pine Tree Power Company helps the local economy by reinvesting in our grid and our workers rather than sending profits abroad. Companies' commitment to achieving our climate goals in Maine would pave the way for more jobs installing renewables, and it would partner with local Maine governments to help them decarbonize. Pine Tree Power Company values current workers by maintaining their jobs, contracts, seniority, and pensions. It will be operated by high quality professionals who take direction from the elected and accountable board. It will also employ new workers to strengthen our grid against storms and expand it to support our electrifying economy. Our power believes that Maine can be the first state to reach net zero. We can do this equitably and affordably through the consumer owned Pine Tree Power Company. Experts agree, this is a completely legal and financially prudent proposal. We cannot afford to transition to clean energy via any other means, and we cannot wait. Our power supports legislation pending at the State House to replace CMP and Versant with a consumer owned utility. We are prepared to bring the question to the Maine people by a ballot initiative if necessary. Maine people deserve better than the status quo of high rates, poor reliability, and no climate vision or leadership from our utilities. The Our Power effort is rooted in climate justice. We seek to reduce energy poverty in Maine, which is some of the highest in the country. Every Mainer deserves access to clean and affordable home heating, cooling, transportation, moving away from unpredictable oil and gas prices. Pine Tree Power Company will give all communities a say in Maine's energy future. Thank you so much for learning more about Our Power and our efforts to reach net zero affordably and equitably. We welcome you to join our growing coalition Please visit us at ourpowermain.org on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and save the date to testify virtually at the State House on Earth Day. Your voice matters in our efforts. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nicole. I, I love the, that logo. Is that a shout out to Maine's original state flag? It, it absolutely is. Nice. Love that. Um, thank you so much. Welcome. Next, we've got Shannon Brenner and Chris Borden. Um, they are co-coordinators co for local, the Local Food Council, Community Food Matters, and Chris is also the program manager for Foothills Food Works. Take it away, you guys. Awesome, thank you. 
Um, hi all, uh, we all know about the intrinsic relationship between our food system and the state of our climate. Community Food Matters Food Council recognizes the central role that food plays in the health and resiliency of people and planet and organizes to support a better food system for the Western foothills. Born from CB's food working group, CFM has official, was officially founded in 2009 as one of Maine's first food councils. Food councils can take many forms, but most councils reflect networks of organizations and individuals from across food sectors dedicated to some combination of coordination in the community, information gathering, advocacy and policy work, and education and program, all towards a better food system. Um, in our state, we have the main network of community food councils, which is a statewide network of 12 food councils and growing um, that support each other through shared gifting and ongoing communication about successes, challenges, and opportunities. Um, networks projects include the main food atlas and support of the New England food vision. Um, so Community Food Matters is um, our local food council here in um, Southern Oxford County in the Foothills region. Um, CFM's mission is focused on, um, is focused on open community-wide collaboration and networking towards equity, health and resiliency in our food system. Um, in addition to serving as a coordination and information hub, CFM provides um, support for several community projects. Um, tonight, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the Community Food Charter and what exactly that is, as well as the Foothills Food Festival and what's happening with that this year. And my co-coordinator, Chris, will take, talk about the awesome work he's been doing with uh, Foothills Food Works this past year in the community. So the Western Foothills Community Food Charter was launched just over a year ago. Um, drafting the charter was a huge effort drawing from community input and to really drive the formation of it and it highlights the shared social, economic, environmental, and health and wellness values we stand for in our Foothills food systems. I'll have more info on how to get involved with that at the end of the presentation. The Foothills Food Festival was started in 2016 as a way to celebrate the food and agricultural renaissance happening in Western Maine Foothills. The festival has featured dozens of food vendors, producers, and artists, and has offered countless educational and community programs over the years around local food, food access, and food waste and composting. Um, sadly, like so much of 2020, the festival was canceled this past August. Um, currently, plans are in the works to provide engagement opportunities in 2021, even though the in-person event will unfortunately again not be happening, but be sure to check Facebook for um, updates on the festival. Now I'm going to turn it over to Chris, who is the project manager for Foothills Food Works. Thanks. At the beginning of summer 2020, during a brainstorming session after many weekly CFM meetings and hours of food pantries, Foothills Food Works was created to help address the increase of food insecurity, as well as make connections in our local food system. We wanted to get prepared meals made by made with local food and local people to community members that are un otherwise unable to get them. I lost my notes. The survey we sent out to the pantries had a bunch of different questions. Uh, one of them if they was if they would be interested in uh, distributing meals with their food boxes, and we got some feedback uh, from four of them and started with them. Our first round of funding was secured through the Alameda B. Soul Foundation to help purchase as much locally produced food as possible. Uh, working with these farms has created some great connections in our food system. We hope to build on these connections and create contracts with some of these farms to ensure we can continue to provide local food and support our local farmers. Along with purchasing local food, our funding was able to pay restaurant workers that were struggling through the pandemic a fair wage to make these meals. We've started to involve more community members in the kitchen to open up some commercial kitchen training to provide people with some experience that they can then put on a job application or a resume for uh, one of the many, many restaurants in the area. Uh, engaging and supporting in, uh, with our local restaurants and businesses is a huge part of the project. 76 Pleasant Street Restaurant donates their time to prepare one of our meals every month. We've also been working with Cafe Nomad and Fair Share Co-op to purchase bulk ingredients that we can't get locally. Spoke Folks, uh, who you heard from earlier, delivers meals within a small radius, and we've also been working with uh, Allen Day Community Garden to get some food as well. Uh, the Norway Grange has been an integral part of this project by allowing us to use their uh, giant kitchen to make these meals. We've been able to purchase a refrigerator and use their basement for vegetable storage, uh, and also uh, start distributing from them. Uh, we couldn't do so much of this project without community connection. The project has built upon and created new connections within the food system and the community. 
uh, farms and restaurants, uh, connecting restaurants to the farms, community members in the kitchen, farms of the food pantries, uh, just a few of the ways that we can have connections in the local food system. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our sponsors that made it possible to get the project off the ground. We couldn't have done it without them. Uh, it truly takes a community. If you'd like to sponsor or donate this cause, uh, you can send us an email. I'll put the link in the chat um, or message us on Facebook or Instagram. And I'll turn it back to my co-coordinator co extraordinaire, Shannon. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Um, so we've had an incredible network of core organizations that have contributed to CFM over the years, many currently in this room, but we're ready to grow and we've cur we're currently working on building collaborative structure for our council. So stay tuned for more info on getting involved with that growth. But today I have two calls to action. Um, first, sign up to be a Food Shutter Champion. Um, as a champion, you'll be added to our mailing list and receive updates about getting involved. It's the easiest way to get plugged into our network and you become part of a movement for an equitable, healthy and resilient food system read the full charter and sign up at ecologybasedeconomy.org slash food matters. And second, CFM is joining the Food Solutions New England 21 day racial equity challenge starting April 5th. We're inviting you all to join us in understanding and uprooting, uprooting racism in our food system. Um, to register, visit the FSNE website and to participate in community check-ins with CFM, email communityfoodmatters at gmail.com. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and if you wanna support climate justice by building to work an equitable and healthy and resilient food system for all, then please be in touch. Um, check out our website, currently on the CB website, as well as our Facebooks for the Council and Food Works. Thank you all. Thank you to CB for this event and keep working for climate justice. Awesome. Oops. Terrific, thank you so much. I love the calls to action. That was great. A lot of good work happening really, really right out our door and in our door. Um, so last but not least, um, pulling the anchor leg for the evening <laughs> is Scott Vaughn, our executive director here at CV. He has been passionate about creating equitable access to solar, solar power for many years. He lives off the grid in Otis Field with the help of a few solar panels. Scott. All right. Happy to be here. Awesome presentations. Um, so yeah, I'm Scott and I, we've been trying to launch CB Community Solar for quite some time and have done, had, there's been a lot of struggle to get good solar policy in Maine, but we're getting there and we are working towards an equity-based cooperative model for community solar in our community. Um, but meanwhile, I'm gonna talk about some other things. So that's our sun right there, our star, 173, thousand is how many terawatts of energy it puts out every day, which is 10,000 times more than we actually use. So let's um, garner that energy. And that little thing up in the corner, that was the space station running off of that solar power. Great photo from NASA. This is a solar panel on my shop. It takes 300 watts of that 173 trillion watts and turns it into usable electricity so I can charge my power tools and run some lights and play some tunes. This is weird. That's a community. That's Those are solar panels. Um, that is, everybody looks really happy. I think that I'm trying to make the case here. Community solar makes people happy. It might be something to do with those electric vehicle chargers too that we just um, initiated over at the high school. So why community solar? So when you're watching Netflix at night and you know where your electricity comes from, it just makes you happier. Um, it makes you happier to know that you're lowering your carbon footprint and the sun shines for free, no need to buy fuel. Um, and you don't need a site if you uh, get involved with community solar. And of course, there's no air pollution involved from burning fossil fuels. You don't have to stress about those nasty mega dams and Quebec that are destroying ecosystems and displacing First Nation people. There's no drilling, no spilling. So solar spills are awesome. Um, and who are we doing this for? We're doing it for our kids, for the next generations. We're doing it for those frontline communities that are having their communities, you know, fracked. They're, there's um, refineries. They live downstream from the tar sands. And we're doing it for the planet. We're doing it for all the other life on this planet and to try to stave off that sixth great extinction, mass extinction that's coming on. So what is community solar? Basically a single solar farm generates electricity for multiple households 
the power company gives you a credit for a percentage of that solar farm toward your electricity bill, simple as can be. How does it work? Maine has a net metering policy or net energy billing, which basically means that the solar array produces power, the credits get applied to your bill. You can store up those credits in the summer, use them in the winter when there's less sun, and we can put as many meters as we want onto uh, on a arrays up to five megawatts. Basically, it just aggregates the electricity demands of a whole bunch of people, a whole bunch of households, manage a solar array to meet all of that demand, and then spreads that costs out much cheaper than putting it on your rooftop probably. Um, and it makes it more affordable. And it's great if you have a lousy site that has shade and you don't wanna cut down your lovely trees. So a couple different models, you can subscribe or you can own. And two of our sponsors, Power Market Revision Energy represent these two, these two models that are, that are out there. And we'll talk about those in a second. Um, both um, important, both, good depending on your situation. So the power market has a subscription model. Right away, tonight, you can go on their website, you can subscribe and begin to save 10% on the kilowatt hours that you use. No cash up front, easy in, you wanna get out, easy out. And if you do it, make sure you put CB as a referral code and we get a donation from power market. If you move, just take your share with you. If you stay in CMP service area, with this subscription model, you just unsubscribe, find another community solar farm where you go, or just install solar if you have a more suitable location to wherever you move to. No sweat, very easily done. Um, the ownership model, you're gonna need a little cash up front and or some credit, because um, it takes, you know, you're gonna have to buy into this, into the, into the model, but once you pay that off, long-term savings, um, and it will lock in your energy costs over a long period of time. And I will add that all of this is gonna be so much easier with that consumer owned utility. If you move and you're in that ownership model, you can again, take your share with you if you're in CMP area, or you can, you're gonna to have to sell your share to someone else and then move on and figure out your solar wherever you move to. That's a long 20 seconds. Um, so. What if we build an equity-based cooperative model? Could we have the best of both worlds? Could we increase accessibility to clean energy at a lower cost? I think we can. We can absolutely do that, but it's gonna take some work. So let's build that equity-based cooperative model. It will keep profits for the consumer owners of a, cooper of, of a consumer cooperative. It'll keep all that cash, all that profit in the community and provide long-term savings for all the co-op owners because these will be consumer owners. We will own our own community solar farms. Um, it will utilize lots of small sites all over the area and it'll move our Western foothills towards this local distributed smart grid that we know is gonna be the future of electricity. Again, much more um, doable with the consumer owned utility and it will lower and stabilize energy costs for everybody involved. Are there challenges to this model? Absolutely. It's going to take time and money. It's going to, we, we need to create a cooperative legal structure to make all this work. We're going to need investors. We're going to need lenders. We're going to need to find all of these small sites, which is all of this is going to take community backing. And that's where you guys all come in. So however you do it, now's the time. Go solar. There is no excuse not to. And stay tuned as we develop our community solar equity-based community solar cooperative in the future. So there we have it. Go solar. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Scott. Love the energy. <laughs> this is great. So uh, thank you so much to all of our presenters. We, we all know how much work it was to try to figure out the, the 20 slides in the 20 seconds. So appreciate that. Loved hearing all the different stories and all the great work that's happening. Um, what we're gonna do right now is Renee is going to put us all in some random breakout rooms. Um, and we're gonna take, let's see what time is it? Oh, okay. So we wanna be mindful of time. Maybe we'll do um, just 10, 10 minutes um, around there, <laughs> maybe a little less, maybe eight minutes um, in breakout rooms, uh, small breakout rooms um, to just kind of talk about with whoever ends up being in your room talk about uh, what resonated with you, what got you excited. So 
Renee, you let us know when we're going to be. All right, hold on. Here you go. Have fun. Okay, thanks. I want to go to gallery view. There we go. Okay, great. Awesome. Thanks so much for joining us um, tonight, everyone. I just, I want to say a couple more things before we let y'all go for the evening, as promised by eight o'clock. Um, first of all, just again, a big thank you to our sponsors. Um, Wheeler Insurance, Sierra Club, Maine, Pleasant Hill Property Services, Natural Resources Council of Maine, Garbo Kane Integrated Solar Builders, Revision Energy Power Market, West Coast, Maine, and Maine Passive House. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all our presenters. You did a great job with a, a challenging format. So that was super. Um, and it was really, I loved everyone's energy and enthusiasm. And there's so much great work happening. So um, makes me feel hopeful. Um, also, we this wouldn't be a CB event if we didn't mention that there's a donation option. <laughs> Obviously, you've already kind of donated because you're here, maybe. But if you feel moved to donate again, um, Renee, I meant to ask you this, Renee, but maybe we'll put it in the chat. <laughs> Sorry, I meant to ask you that before the evening. Um, but you can go to our website, right? And there's there's a way to, to donate there. Oh, thank you. She's on it. So um, there's a donation option on our website. So um, that really helps us. We're a three-person, all part-time um, staff team and it really helps us keep things going. Um, and just a reminder about um, tomorrow and Wednesday and Thursday events. Um, as Mike puts up the slide of what's happening the rest of the week. So we hope to see you again. And um, same time, same place. So that's easy, right? No excuses. <laughs> You've got your Zoom link. And um, there is uh, there was also a slide, I don't know if we're showing that one, but um, if you had any trouble with breakout rooms tonight or whatever, there's a way to update your Zoom so that you can easily access things. So anyway, if that's, oh, right. Here's the slide that shows that. Um, but you can always reach out to our tech staff um, during the evening if you need to um, tomorrow night. So have I forgotten anything? Team, I don't think so. But um, thank you so much. Um, I hope you had some good conversation in your small groups and bring some of that energy and um, a thoughts to tomorrow night and be ready to listen to some amazing, inspiring young people in Maine. And um, if you felt some fire tonight, I guarantee you'll feel more tomorrow night. So uh, staff, we're going to stay on for a few minutes to, to do a little check in before we sign out. But everyone else, thank you so much. And uh, have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your evening. Stay warm. <laughs>